Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm not a developer, uh, as you know now. I'm, I'm a lawyer who advises developers, so I often find myself at, uh, at places like this, uh, which is fun for me. And today I want to talk about a little about um, the subject of software that causes harm and what the legal system uh, does about that problem and why that might be something we should be worried about and what developers can do to, to address that. So um, I, I specialize in open source software and, and uh, what that often means is I find myself confronting software licenses that actually aren't really open source software licenses but sort of masquerade as open source software licenses. And this is one that you, you may have seen if you deal at all with uh, JavaScript minification. So it uh, uh, takes the uh, perfectly good open source license, the MIT license, and adds this, this provision to it. The software shall be used for good, not evil. And, and, and uh, we advocates of open source software, we, we really are, uh, we are annoyed by this, because not because we, we like evil or hate good, but because we, uh, we believe that, that you know, the principle of open source is that it should not be discriminatory and it should not impose use restrictions. So if you can allow restrictions on e arbitrary evil uses, you can then restrict commercial use and, and all sorts of other uses, and that's really what, not, what open source is uh, very much opposed to. But when you, uh, when you think about it, um, it's, the legal system is, is focused on something that's similar to the problem of good and evil, but a little bit different. It's the problem of, of harm and what to do about, about uh, damage and harm and loss and how to assign responsibility for those things. And it's, so it's not so, so unusual to think about a, a, how a software license could address um, those topics. And, uh, software does, you know, software can cause harm. I think I, I uh, you know, I don't need to convince any of you of, of that. Uh, think about a, a software that introduces a security vulnerability or um, causes data loss, but it can be worse than that. Um, software can, in some cases, cause damage to physical property. It can cause damage to people. It can injure people's bodies, and in some cases, software can even cause death unfortunately, and, and uh, can be very, very tragic. In some ways, it's really surprising that we don't hear more about um, fatal accidents involving software, where software is, is the cause. And, and this, this problem is only going to get more acute in the future, I think, um, as we, we continue to move to this world where software is uh, you know, involved in all aspects of our lives, and, and we have um, devices in our workplace, in our homes, and when we do shopping, uh, all these devices and objects that are now running software, and they're all gathering our data and talking to each other over networks. And, and uh, you know, th that just increases the, uh, the possibility for injury and harm and loss where software is, is the cause. So the problem's going to get get worse, or at least the perception of a problem is going to get worse. Now, um, the, just to explain, the, the, the legal system, the, there are lots of ways the legal system addresses the, the issue of um, how to assign responsibility for harm. So, so people can enter into agreements with each other where you know, the agreement takes care of the issue or tries to take care of the issue. And software licenses are, are an example of this. So you can enter into a software license agreement where you decide um, you know, who's going to bear the risk of uh, a problem of harm if, if uh, the software results in harm. But there's also the, the issue of um, civil responsibility in, in the French legal system, in, in Anglo-American systems, we call it torts. And this is where you can uh, bring a lawsuit against someone if you believe they've harmed you and uh, the harm is the result of their negligence, or even if it's not the result of their fault, but, uh, but it's because of a product that's um, unreasonably dangerous. And then, of course, you have criminal law and you have uh, regulation of, of uh, product safety. And there's various ways in which the, the legal system addresses this issue. Now, the interesting thing about software is that software has, for, for uh, you know, it's the entire lifetime of the industry enjoyed this special status where it, it hasn't really been subject to the same degree of regulation as, as uh, other kinds of products. So um, th this is an excerpt of uh, the uh, Oracle uh, JDK JRE binary code license, which you've probably all agreed to at some point. It's, I don't mean to pick on Oracle because you'll find something similar in most um, off-the-shelf 
uh, software licenses. What, what, the, these, uh, what this language is saying is, you know, we, we absolve ourselves, we the software distributor and developer, absolve ourselves of all responsibility, pretty much, of uh, any harm that you, the user of the software, may experience as a result of taking my software. And, and these kinds of provisions are largely um, accepted, and uh, they're standard in the industry. You'll, you know, the differences, there may be differences in different jurisdictions in, in France versus the United States. Uh, maybe there's, uh, you know, some difference in the degree to which all of this will be enforced in all situations. But by and large, this is a worldwide standard. And, and uh, you know, we don't really see this in other industries. So it's something worth thinking about. Uh, so, so I think that as, as software becomes more dominant in our lives and as the, as the likelihood of, of accidents and, and, and injury involving software in necessarily is going to increase in the future, you, you know, the, the legal system is, is likely to reassess this historical uh, uh, dual system in which software has enjoyed this special status where it hasn't been regulated as much. For, uh, and, and, and there is a historical precedent in the United States. Um, at one time, the automobile industry, the automobile manufacturing industry, was, in, was not very heavily regulated in terms of product safety. But uh, that began to change uh, in the 1960s when uh, consumer advocates focused attention on how m many of the popular cars of the day were very badly designed and, and were designed in such a way that uh, there was an unreasonable uh, danger of risk that, you know, that resulted from, from those cars. And uh, the legal system really responded in the United States. Uh, they, they did a total about-face. They, they, there was much more heavy regulation of car manufacturing as a result, and um, the courts um, imposed much stricter liability systems on car manufacturers. And so there's certainly the possibility that that could happen in the future with software. And you might say, why, why is this a bad thing. It's certainly a good thing that this happened in the in the car manufacturing industry. And the the thing that I worry about is that the you know the the judges or the courts that 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 are going to be addressing these problems they well, they don't actually look like like this person here. But but you get get the idea that that they they, um, they don't necessarily know very much about software or the software industry. And and there's a danger that they may overreact and get get this whole problem wrong. They they may. Uh, they may impose uh, liability rules on the whole software industry that are, are stricter than necessary or that may fail to distinguish uh, between different types of software. Um, so um, imagine if safety-critical software is treated the same way as web development software, for example. Uh, another possibility, uh, or another thing that I'm worried about is uh, open source software. So uh, uh, open source software licenses have the same kinds of provisions as that uh, Oracle proprietary license I showed you, where you disclaim as much responsibility as possible. And, and there's important reasons for this for open source. We want to encourage companies and individuals to contribute to, to, uh, to projects. Um, if, if, that, if, if we change to a regime in which uh, contributors are discouraged from contributing because they're, they're going to be afraid of being sued for their contributions, now that's, that's, contributions are the lifeblood of open source software, and, and that would be a, a tremendous problem if we start uh, imposing a, a very different system on, on open source software. Uh, another issue for open source is that uh, you know, with open source, you, you get the source code. The user gets the source code, and I think there's a... There's a a stronger policy reason for treating that situation different, differently from the situation where you know you're you're not providing the source code because if the user gets the source code, they can examine it, they can in, they can in principle make corrections, they can they can assess, uh, the, the, you know whether the software is safe to use or not. Certainly to a greater degree than if they don't get the source code at all. So very concerned about the possibility of of overregulation of open source software, and so. What, what, what can we, we do about this? So I, I think that uh, I would say developers should think about getting ahead of the legal system uh, as to this problem. Uh, and, and you may think that, that this doesn't really relate to the kind of software that you all develop. But, but remember, the, as I've been trying to say, the, the, the legal system is likely to, to paint this whole uh, issue with, with a broad brush. They will treat the entire software industry in the same way, they, they, there's a danger that they won't distinguish between one type of software versus another type of software. So, so developers should think about the, the possibility of self-regulation, what we call self-regulation. This is, this is a concept that's familiar to uh, other 
other professions, uh, like, like the medical profession, the legal profession, uh, other engineering professions, they, they, um, they largely um, avoid excessive state regulation by regulating themselves, I mean, uh, taking on the responsibility for ensuring that, that they do the right thing. And this is something that we can do in the software, in the software industry. So one aspect of this that's kind of obvious is that uh, you, you know, your, your own technological choices uh, can, can make a difference. So we're, you know, if you've heard the expression, software is eating the world, what that means is that, that software is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's taking on a role in all aspects of our lives. It's all companies are turning into software companies, in a sense. Uh, and, and what's happened and what's great for developers is that this has really increased the autonomy and the, the influence that developers have in organizations. Historically, developers very often in companies didn't have much control over the kind of technology they used, but we're, we're shifting to a world in which developers really get to, to uh, call the shots. And, and there's something um, very good about that uh, for purposes of the problem that I've been talking about. Because if, if, you, you know, if you can choose the kinds of technologies you use, you have the opportunity to pick technologies uh, with this problem of uh, safety and harm and, and minimization of error in mind. And, and on some level, you all do this already, but it's something that I would suggest that you should bear in mind. So when you think about what programming language you want to use or what framework, uh, development framework you want to use or how you approach testing or uh, any sort of design methodology. Think about the issue of you know, minimization of harm to the user. And uh, you obviously cannot minimize all error in software development, but, but there are some, some technologies are going to be more prone to causing harm than others. And this should be something that uh, we all should think about. The other, um, the other aspect of self-regulation and, and more familiar to the, the other uh, professions that I talked about, like law and medicine and uh, you know, traditional engineering, is, is the notion of, um, of ethics. So, so the, the traditional professions develop these elaborate systems of ethics that uh, are designed to, to, uh, to provide guidance to members of the profession in, in how to deal with the difficult situations that uh, people may find themselves in. Um, so this is uh, a version of the Hippocratic Oath, a French, an old French version of it, uh, which is the foundation for medical ethics, right? And uh, we also have in the legal profession, both in, here in France and the United States and, and other countries, we have very elaborate systems of um, codes of ethics and professional responsibility guiding uh, lawyers in how to deal with situations involving, you know, wh what is the limit of their responsibility for the client in a situation where there doesn't seem to be one clear right answer? What is the, what is the answer that is the, the best of all possible uh, actions to take? This is, this is the purpose of these codes of ethics and codes of professional responsibility that we have. In, uh, in, in traditional engineering, uh, we, we have these as well. Uh, we, so we, we never really developed codes of ethics that really caught on in software engineering and software development. There have been uh, various proposals over the years to, to adopt such things. The uh, IEEE and the ACM have uh, promulgated possible codes of ethics for programming, but they're, they're, really, um, they're not really very well developed at, at present. In, in traditional um, engineering, like civil engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, we, we do, however, have these um, elaborate codes of ethics and professional responsibility, just like in uh, law and medicine. And, and what actually led to the development of these things in engineering was, um, to a large extent, 100 years ago or so, there were a number of very serious accidents, uh, many of them involving uh, bridges, bridge design, like th this is the, uh, the Quebec Bridge. Uh, uh, I think the middle portion of that bridge uh, collapsed uh, 100 years ago. And, and these, these incidents um, really spurred the engineering professions to, to uh, take action and start to regulate themselves and, and set standards for um, how they deal with the issue of, of safety and, and design. And we can, we can do this in, in, the, in the software developer profession as well. Now, we do, the, the approaches of these traditional professions to the, the topic of professional responsibility is not, 
perfect by any means. I've been a critic of, uh, I certainly have been a critic of medical ethics for various reasons, uh, certain aspects of medical ethics. I've been a, a critic of uh, the legal ethics system and for various specific reasons or, or specific aspects of it. But, um, and, and in particular, um, the, 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 these systems, ha there's always a danger that they're just sort of uh, pretexts for keeping uh, people out of the profession. So that's the, the, the sort of anti-competitive tendency is sometimes associated with, with these, these uh, codes of ethics. But, but, but this, you know, software developers can, uh, can take the good from these, these approaches that other professions take and avoid the, uh, the bad things. You know, the, the, one of the great things about software development is that it's really very, uh, very open in, in the sense that, you know, uh, you know, you don't have to all go to certain types of schools to become a software developer. You don't have to pass an exam to be a software developer. That, that's the way it works in the, the medical profession and the legal profession. So it's much more admirably open than, than other professions. And really, uh, uh, they, software development provides a model for, for uh, what other professions should do in, in that sense. But software development can learn from, from the other professions in, in this way of, uh, adopting codes of ethics and responsibility to to get ahead of the the possible problem of the state, you know, reacting to to uh, the, the reacting to the possible uh, uh, increase in in harm caused by software in the future, and maybe taking things a little bit too far. So I, I encourage all of you who are software developers to think about this issue. And to think about, uh, start thinking of yourselves as you know, more of a professional body and think about how you can develop your own rules and choices that can uh, uh, address the issue of safety so that, so that we achieve results that can uh, encourage software innovation to continue in the years ahead. Thank you. <laughs>